Okay. Uh, well, welcome everybody and hello. Uh, thanks for joining us for today's webinar, Public Input Needed, Designing and Facilitating Community Engagement in Town Forest. My name is Kate Four, and I work for the Vermont Urban and Community Forestry Program, which is a collaboration between UVM Extension and Vermont Department of Forest, Parks and Recreation. Today's webinar is the first in our Town Forest webinar series. These webinars are actually a part of a broader project entitled Community Forests as Models of Stewardship. We'll be sharing more about this initiative in the coming months. The initiative is designed to elevate the role of community forests as models of stewardship in Vermont's forest land. In addition to these webinars, we expect to be launching some new and exciting resources uh, in the coming months. So again, please stay tuned for more on that initiative. This project is also a collaboration with UVM Extension, Vermont Land Trust, and Vermont Department of Forest Parks and Recreation, as well as other partners, including the Northern Forest Center and Vermont Cupboards. The project was made possible by funding from the USDA Forest Landscape Scale Restoration Grant. I just want to quickly acknowledge um, the funding in them as well. All right, so the plan for today's webinar um, is that it's going to run kind of like a panel. <clears throat> we'll start off with a presentation on community engagement by the team from Vermont Council on Rural Development. And then we're going to hear from two community volunteers who will share their experience and strategies in engaging residents around their community forest. After the presentations, we'll have time for a panel discussion and question and answer, which I, I will be facilitating. So before I hand the mic over to our first presenters, I wanted to cover just a few logistics. I know we're all fairly comfortable and confident in um, using webinars these days, but um, your microphones will be muted or and we ask that um, and given Zoom, I think you do have the option to unmute, uh, but we ask for now that you keep your microphones muted. As you've discovered, um, your cameras can be on during the presentation, but just a note that we are recording this presentation. And so um, if you don't want your video to be recorded as part of the presentations today, um, please go ahead and keep your camera off. Your, um, as I mentioned, your microphones are muted, but we do really wanna hear from you and engagement and interaction is really important to, um, to me and to our presenters today as part of this webinar. Uh, and so we invite you to use the chat box which can be found on the side panel to share any questions, comments, um, or thoughts throughout the presentation. As I mentioned earlier, the webinar is being recorded and we will have a link to the presentation um, on the Vermont, Vermont Urban and Community Forestry YouTube channel for future uh, viewing, as well as sharing um, a link to participants who have registered um, after, who have registered for the webinar after the presentation today. One last logistical thing, uh, in terms of CEUs, I've received a couple of questions. Um, I do have a request pending with SAF. And so if you're interested in receiving SAF uh, CEUs for today's presentation, please go ahead and put your name and email address in the chat box and I will follow up with you after the webinar. Okay, well, I think that's it from my end. Um, so uh, again, thank you everybody for taking the time to join us today. Um, and I'd like to go ahead and turn the mic over to Jenna, or actually let me introduce Jenna and, um, and Jessica. Um, so um, our first presentation uh, today is gonna be on community engagement, sharing an overview. Um, Jenna and Jessica, if you guys wanna go ahead and start sharing your screen and get your presentation up. That'd be great. Um, so as I was saying, yeah, our first presentation today is from the team at Vermont Council on Rural Development. Jenna is a community engagement and policy director at the Vermont Council on Rural Development. She leads their community visit program, as well as their community leadership network, helping to bring communities together to make decisions about the future and connect resources and support that's needed to be successful. Jenna lives in Huntington. Our second presenter from Vermont Council on Rural Development is Jessica Savage. Jessica joined the VCRD staff in 2021 after 15 years in the public sector mainly in natural resources and recreation management fields. She serves as their Director of Community Collaboration. She has an MBA from UVM and is an avid outdoorsman and a mom to two young children. So with that guys, I think now that I've officially introduced you, I will go ahead and turn the presentation over to you guys. Great, thanks Kate. And does this, does my screen look okay for the, the PowerPoint? Yep, All right. great. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for, for having us. Um, I, uh, so as, as Kate said, Jessica and I work with Vermont Council on Rural Development. Um, you know, I think uh, 
essentially what our work is, is helping to engage communities all around the state. We are facilitators, neutral conveners of uh, community process in Vermont. Um, we have uh, facilitated and coordinated community conversations in hundreds of towns around the state. Um, and so our expertise is really in, um, in that community engagement and in facilitation. Um, what's nice is now that Jessica has joined our team, we also have someone on the team that actually does have a lot of expertise in this um, public lands and recreation planning as well. So our hope in this presentation is to kind of give you some of the basics and tips and strategies around community engagement generally, but also to do our best to ground that um, those tips in the work that you may be doing in your own communities around your town forest or community forest. Um, you know, I think I'm looking around, I, I recognize some names on here and I know everyone here is interested in uh, the world of you know, conservation, town forest, maintenance, acquisition, et cetera. And often we get into this work because we love recreation and, and we're passionate about conservation or hunting or snowmobiling, whatever it is. Um, but many of us don't have a ton of background in, in community engagement and facilitation. However, um, when you get, when you jump into this type of work, you realize pretty quickly that it's pretty critical. Um, bringing the community voices in, getting folks together, making decisions together, it becomes such an integral part of the, of the process. So um, the intention here is to walk through a few different um, steps. So first, we really want to frame when is community engagement helpful or necessary in the work that you're doing? Um, why you might engage with the community, um, you know, finding what is your purpose? Why bring people together to ask um, the questions that you wanna find out and then how? So our hope is to give some practical tips around framing a process, inviting the public, a little bit about the kind of actual holding of the meeting or whatever uh, form your engagement takes. And then finally, um, some thoughts and tips on, on using all that input to come to decision. So starting out, uh, when to engage. Um, a few general tips here. Um, one really important one is early in the process. You know, one, I think sometimes, um, you know, we can make a mistake in terms of if, if you're already far along the decision-making path and have not engaged and then realize, oh, we better, you know, reach out to some people so we can say we did engagement. Um, that's probably not gonna be that, that effective. It's really important um, before you get started in any decision-making, whatever point you find yourself in the process, um, to really, to bring in voices early. People want to be included as early as possible um, and that will lead to the most authentic and meaningful engagement in the community. Um, another important tip is uh, it's important to engage if the project will affect many people um, in the community. And of course, a town forest or community forest project is going to impact many people in your community. But also it can be important to engage where a project or a part of the project or a concept is complex or controversial or where there may not be existing community consensus. Um, you know, we, engage for many different reasons, which we'll get into. And one of the reasons engagement can be really valuable is actually helping the community to form their own thoughts and opinions on a topic. Sometimes when you come into a conversation on a controversial topic, um, it can be about you soliciting input, but also a chance for people to air their concerns, a chance for people to hear, you know, you somebody might come into a meeting with a very clear sense of what they believe or what they think to be true, but hearing from other community members can help them form a more you know, nuanced uh, uh, opinion or even change their opinion on a, on a topic. And so it can be really important where there's, it can be intimidating where there's controversy to engage, but sometimes those can be the most important moments to help the community um, come to some kind of common conversation. Um, a quick example there is just when we worked, we worked with the town of Montgomery not too long ago, and uh, we were asking them ideas for priorities about, you know, for the future of the town. And a lot of people came in with very different ideas of, you know, we need housing in our community. We need childcare. We need business growth. 
um, really different ideas about what they wanted to see in the community. And through community conversation, having this very open forum to say what's most important for the future, they actually ended up prioritizing and working on wastewater infrastructure, um, which I doubt, I'm sure there was a handful, but probably not many people that came into that meeting passionate about wastewater <laughs> infrastructure. But through that conversation, they were able to see, well, in order to meet these common needs that we, or the, these differing needs that we all have, um, that could be something that we can work on today to, to get there. Um, a couple other pieces of when it's important to engage uh, where people may sense that power is not balanced, um, you know, where uh, it may feel like there's a dominant voice in the community around an initiative or project, or where people just may not feel like they are a part of the conversation. Um, you know, I, I think uh, a community forest example is a, is a good one where, um, you know, people who see themselves as recreators, as, um, you know, a hunter, they kind of identify with that. But if there's other members of the community that don't identify with that, but they still have an important voice here, they still have an important role to play. Um, you know, it can be important to really do that inclusive and broad outreach and engagement so that you start to build more balance in that power dynamic and build more ownership around a, a concept or a project. Uh, and then finally, sometimes you may find yourself in a situation where there are requirements around community engagement. Maybe your select board has charged you with um, bringing in community voices or decision making. Maybe an easement holder would um, have some requirement around that. Um, maybe a, a grant, you know, a funder would have some requests. So there may be moments where it is required and, and you need to find the best way um, to bring that outreach into your, your process. And so the other important aspect here is what's the purpose? Why use which tools and when? Um, this chart that's on your screen here outlines kind of like a, a public engagement spectrum. You can think of it in that way. Um, there are all kinds of reasons that we will engage with the community and you'll engage in different ways at different moments in the work that you're doing. And they're all valid and they're all important. There's nothing wrong with any of these forms of engagement, but they're all gonna serve different purposes for your project. And so when we have somebody, a community or a community group coming to us, to ask us for facilitation support, this is kind of the first thing that we're doing is thinking about, well, what are the needs in this community, in this project? What are the, what's the need in terms of engagement? What's the outcome that you might be looking for? Um, and then what are the right tools to use in order to achieve that outcome? And so looking at this chart, you can think of inform to empower as a, as a spectrum um, from kind of light engagement to very intensive um, engagement. Uh, so you think about inform, it's really more about, you know, there are times where it's just about informing the public, sharing information, helping them to understand what's happening next in your process, flyers, newsletters, websites, maybe a panel discussion. There's no intention to collect input, it's just about sharing information. And that sometimes is a really important tool in engagement, oftentimes throughout, you know, um, the, the process that you're leading. That kind of next step is consulting. So this may be a place where information is shared and you want to collect some kind of community input, but there's a very clear line between um, public comment and then, you know, who is actually making decision, which may be the select board. It may be your um, stewardship committee. It may be um, you know, whoever it might be, uh, the community isn't coming to final decision, but you're wanting to hear people's input, hear from focus groups, surveys, a facilitated forum where you're collecting input and comments. Um, involve, where you're maybe working directly with, um, still decision-making is held by, not within the public, but by a decision-making group, but you have a more kind of collaborative approach to visioning exercises, small group discussions, really engaging the community in a little bit of a deeper way. Collaborate is taking that to the, to the next level where you might have advisory committees that are informing a process. Um, you're really partnering with the community in developing um, alternatives, visions, choosing actions. And then there's that last level, which is empower. So in this case, this is where the final decision may be up to the community. The community owns the project or initiative. Um, you're asking people to 
sign on to, to work on different initiatives. You're asking people to do it, you know, have, make it take a, va a ballot vote on deciding yes or no on a, some aspect of your of your project. Um, and so you may imagine kind of picturing any work that you've done with community engagement, all of these are gonna be important at different steps along the way and they're all relevant, but the most important thing is for you to understand where you want to be on this spectrum and what's most useful for you in that moment. And then to communicate that openly to the public that you're engaging with so that everyone comes into the process with a shared understanding. Because if I'm a community member and I come in ex expecting to be part of a decision, but really I'm just being consulted, that can lead to some distrust or confusion or frustration. And so that clarity up front and throughout the process is really critical. Um, and Jessica, I think I'll hand it to you to share a little more about where this fits in specifically to town forest management. Sure, yeah, I, we thought it would be good just to give some, sorry, there was a little echo there, um, uh, give some examples that might be familiar to you all um, on this call. Uh, good to see some names of folks I recognize from my previous life. Um, so informing the public, as Jenna explained, sort of what that is in a town forest that can look like you know, upcoming management activities, uh, signage actually within the forest itself or what's a decision that's already been made, something that's going to happen or is happening, letting the public know about that in a variety of formats. Um, it also is done a lot after you've done an assessment phase. So any kind of assessment work as you're building a management plan, um, we often end up informing the public of um, those assessments that have been done by consultants or experts, right? Sort of your wildlife assessment, your um, natural resources assessment, things like that. You're informing the public of what has been found on forests, right? Um, and then we often couple that with consulting the public during the management phase. We tell them the assessments that have been done, and then we solicit public input on um, management decisions. A lot of times uh, the consulting happens um, at a couple of different moments in your management planning uh, process. Um, and, and, and a lot of times that's the appropriate level of public uh, input and engagement that is needed. But again, as Jenna said, just being clear that that's, that's all that can happen at this point. You've already made your management recommendations or you're about to send it to the select board for approval and you're really just getting some more input from the public. Um, and then when you involve the public, that can really look like, um, that interim phase as you're, uh, as you're drafting the management plan, you haven't really written the management recommendations yet. That's maybe where it's, it's more than just consulting or involving the public in, in what management might look like. Uh, collaborating with the public um, can look like visioning for the future for the town forest. Uh, Community-led forest management planning where it's a little more deliberately crafted alongside the community. Um, and as Jenna mentioned, empowering the community, that's, we often see that on town meeting day or other ballot items where they have to approve the budget, they have to approve um, some statutory change or something like that. that. That's what that looks like a lot on town for us. Uh, or acquisition as well, approving again, usually through town meeting or some other ballot item, approving that acquisition. Great, and I think, um... Jessica, as we move forward, I think you've got the floor still. And then uh, I do. Yes. Yes. So if you oh. move. <laughs> yeah. So the, the how to engage, I think we just wanted to uh, again ground this in hopefully the reality you face. Um, so in, in a lot of instances, you know, town forests are the responsibility of the select board. Um, you know, and, and the town forest committee is tasked with certain activities, right? That the select board must approve. Um, you often have to make those recommendations alongside other legal interests. So you might have easement holders, you might have um, in holdings, you might have people with rights of way. You, there, are, there are folks who have other interests in the town forest, but the real interest for the town forest is the community. You know, the town, the town people um, own the forest collectively, right? Um, and so really thinking more broadly, even within what can feel like a constrained environment where you have all these different interests to balance as well as assessments and um, experts to consult with, um, you know, really considering that, um, that big 
other aspect of public engagement. And some of those parties I just mentioned are often really wanting to collaborate on, on community engagement processes. Um, the example I put up here was one from FPR, my FPR days. Um, we have uh, Bingham Falls, which is a great place and where I got my career started with the state of Vermont, building lots and lots of stone steps. Um, you know, the state owns the land, the Stowe Land Trust has, a, has an easement, and then of course the town has legal interests as well and really is responsible for the road and how people get there and the parking lot. And, and so they all co-hosted every public input meeting. Um, and so just also thinking about are there other groups out there, a friends of group, a trail group, some other entity that has more than just, um, you know, a neighbor, a person in a personal interest in the property who can collaborate with you to be more creative around public engagement and who might um, be beneficial to bring to the table early as you consider how to engage the public. Um, and so with that, I'll hand it back to you, Jenna. Great, thanks. And um, yeah, and so the reason kind of Jessica is teeing up some of that is whenever we're talking about public engagement, the first thing that I believe is, is critical to think about is building your building your team. Who, who is working with you on design and of this community engagement? And that is useful for a couple of different reasons. One, just for capacity. Um, I'll say this again later on, but there's really not, I wish there was, but there really isn't a kind of silver bullet to community engagement and to inviting the public together. It's really about hitting the ground, capacity, time, getting the word out and getting people involved. Um, the more that you can engage a, a team rather than just you know a few individuals in doing that work is great. And it will help you to connect to a broader cross section of the community. Um, you know, if you have um, a, a kind of planning or engagement committee or a event committee that's helping to, to plan how you're bringing voices in, um, the more diversity in every sense of that word that you can bring into that team, the better off you'll be in terms of the ability to reach a broad um, cross, -section, cross section of people in your community that may bring really important different perspectives to the conversation. Um, you know, within, uh, uh, I know in some cases you may have a bit of a more prescribed structure, but again, like using partnerships, you know, bringing in um, partner organizations, community groups, um, you know, you, you can really think about, you know, who are the folks that can connect us to maybe, you know, more conservative voices in our communities. What about our, our farmers and our, um, business owners who can help us to connect to lower income community members. Um, you know, if you have a planning team that's all mountain bikers, you're gonna get a lot of mountain bike <laughs> voices coming to your meeting. But if you have a planning team that kind of represents the diversity, the diversity of users, then it can really help you to do that outreach from the beginning. Um, what we do when we build, if we're working with a community to build those, um, to bring in those different voices, it can be really helpful to ask others if there are people that you might want to bring in in this conversation. Um, sometimes, you know, we only know who we know in a community, and it can be tempting to just ask the people that you that you already know. But if you start to ask around, if you call up somebody that you know, you know, is connected with the business community and ask them like, hey, do you know of a business owner that might be a really good fit for this, um, for this committee, even if they've never been involved in community work before, they can bring a really interesting um, perspective and may have more capacity to help with some of the outreach than somebody who's already on 10 different committees in town. Um, and so you're going to use your community networking and resources to find those different folks that you can bring into the conversation from the beginning, where possible. And so once you have your team assembled, whatever that team might look like, the next step is really to frame your process and think about what you need in terms of um, tools and ways to engage. So um, with your team, you can kind of review some potential engagement strategies. So you, we shared that chart in the beginning. Um, we also have, and I'll, I'll share this a little bit more later, but we, we also have a community leadership guide, which has several chapters focused on these topics. There's a chapter on framing a public process for engagement. 
There's a chapter on inviting the public, a chapter on what you might do if you want to set priorities in your community, another one on what you might do if you're having a, a visioning conversation. So a lot more there you can get into in terms of the weeds of different meeting structures. Um, but with your team, you know, you can kind of just think about like, do we just need, are we holding a panel discussion where we're going to share information um, about this topic? Do we want to hold a series of meetings where we are, you know, um, brainstorming ideas and then setting priorities for the, the future of the, of the forest? Um, you know, kind of just think about what, what's that process um, and what's the best fit for the point uh, where you are in, in your planning. Um, once you kind of, once you think about that structure, the next important question you want to ask yourself, and this is what we always ask when we're, you know, when we are asked to facilitate with a community is, what's the question that you're asking? What do you want to know from the community? It can be really important to, to kind of develop that framework of, you know, if we get people in a room, if we get people on a Zoom call, um, we get people walking around a set of kind of posters or charrette visioning, <laughs> what is it that we want to ask from the community and frame those questions? You know, for example, um, you know, what is the vision for the future of your town forest? Um, <laughs> what are your thoughts on hunting in the, in the town forest? Whatever that specific question is, make sure that you're coming to it with clarity ahead of time. At the same time, <laughs> you, should, you should be thinking about um, deciding how, <laughs> just, you may have to take over. <coughs> no problem, it's okay. Um, we'll give Jenna a second. Oh, don't you hate those coughing fits to take over? <laughs> um, yeah, so Jenna was saying, you know, consider your capacity, your facilitation needs, the space and time. Do you have, um, do you have internal capacity to lead the work? Do you have design expertise, facilitation ability, space to hold the meetings? You know, there are organizations and individuals around the state who can help frame and facilitate all or part of a process. Um, and we're gonna show more about that on the next slide. Um, you know, again, really thinking about uh, that the key to engagement is listening. Engagement really is about listening. And I know that's hard because a lot of times I think when you're in the, you have a decision-making authority or you have a responsibility, you can feel like you want to talk, you want to explain, you want to craft the environment in which you're getting public input, which is important. You should be honest about what's possible, but it really is about listening um, and making sure that people, um, you know, people are, are feeling heard. Was anybody left out of the process uh, or feel that the process is unfair? Listen and adjust as possible. I can't tell you how many times in public engagement or in setting up different types of opportunities for the public to engage, we've had to adjust. I, I when I worked for FPR, I don't, we adjusted so many times. We, um, reopened public comment many, many times when we realized that, you know, we had missed a whole subset of the population, um, especially when it felt like, you know, no, this is our responsibility to do this well, to do this right, and to really listen and respond to the public. Um, and then one thing we wanted to also mention is in this space, of, of, you know, post COVID slash COVID world, you know, we've all discovered that hybrid or virtual options, uh, love them or not, they do offer a certain amount of accessibility. Um, and just want to put a plug in for the next of these town forest sessions with SE group is going to lead where they're going to talk specifically about how to use uh, hybrid or virtual options um, really impactfully. They have a ton of experience with that. Um, based on our experience, you know, um, a certain amount of accessibility that having a hybrid or virtual option provides, but you do need to think about how to do it well ahead of time. You know, you need um, you need additional staff to make it happen. It's really nice if you can also um, partner with a group locally who has that sort of technical capacity and technical expertise. Um, and Jenna and her team have a ton more um, experience having done it, but. In my brief time with VCRD, we have used a fully hybrid option, um, which we're about to do again for another summit. And it's it's quite the experience to facilitate 
in the room and on the Zoom, and it, it takes a lot of coordination among your facilitators, but um, it does really give people um, an option in a time where they might not be able to show up to an in-person event. Um, so I'm gonna go, I can't move Jenna's slides. Yeah, only. Jessica, I, uh, yeah. Kate chiming in here. I just wanted to mention to uh, folks sure. on the webinar today that I did go ahead and put a link to the community guide in the chat box. Um, so oh, great. Um, I encourage folks to check that out. It's really jam packed with lots of great information um, and uh, examples. So um, so I did put the link directly in the chat box um, for folks to be able right. to, to check out after the webinar. Great. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna keep going until or unless Jenna comes comes back to the to the room, um, and I'll try to do her her justice. <laughs> um, so and I see questions in the chat too, Kate. But I'm gonna leave those up to you to facilitate later as you see fit. Um, so you know when you invite the public, you know you really want to have a plan. I think you know we're em over emphasizing all the ramp up to the actual public meeting or public forum that you're going to have because it's the most important thing. You really want to have an outreach plan. If you want to get real public comment, you have to really work to get the public to comment regardless of the format. You know, um, you want to make a big deal out of it. You want to get the word out in five different ways. The more people hear about it from more sources, the more it feels like a thing they need to be part of, right? A sign in town on the billboard, a neighbor talking to you about it, a phone call from a friend. That seems like a big deal, right? You know, I think we've all experienced um, realizing that a decision has been made and public comment has been had after the fact and that doesn't feel good right so it's a big deal so make it make it one right um there's no there's no magic way to do it um you know we still use old school methods and new school methods we build websites for towns um and we send out flyers in backpacks with school kids like it is it is the way it is you know you've got to get people the way that it's going to work for them i don't know how many times i've heard at a community visit i'm here because so and so called me i'm here because so and so told me i needed to be here that you should not uh, discount that that method of getting people to show up to a public meeting, um, you know, making it personal, um, avoiding tokenizing in all shapes and forms, you know, like, oh, you should, I think you should be there because we don't have, you know, this group of folks represented. Well, that's, that's not a good way to get somebody to show up. Um, and Jenna, I see that you're back. Um, I'm back. <laughs> Are you okay? I'm so sorry. Okay. Yeah, no, it's just like, yeah, perils of having a kid in childcare these days, random cough. Yeah, random cough. <laughs> um, I think I'm okay, but I'll send it back to you if I, if I lost yeah, it again. But, um, totally. but you're doing a great job with my slide. <laughs> oh, um, thanks. <laughs> and maybe uh, what I'll just... Um, I'll, maybe I'll actually skip ahead to kind of where you're headed, which is mm -hmm. um, this is something that the kind of framework that that we use as we're thinking about that invitation um, to the full community. Um, you know, we want everyone in the community to hear about something ten different ways. Like I think I feel like a response I often get when I'm asking people in communities we're working with to help share something is like, well, I bet they heard it through, you know, the historical society or whatever it is. But I always say like, great, let's send it this way too. <laughs> like we want people to feel like this is important. Like it's a big deal. This is something you want to be a part of. Um, and so I think of it in this pyramid of outreach. So the big like broad end of the period is make sure every single person in your community hears about it. And that's these broad outreach strategies like you know, um, a mailing to everybody in town so that everyone on your list gets it. Um, a, uh, you know, social media posting, like this kind of broad outreach, like just get it out there strategies. Um, the next kind of tier there is more like targeted outreach through maybe trusted partners and groups. So work with your planning committee or your partners, anyone in the community who could think about all the different ways you get information out in your town. Is there a historical society that has an email list, um, a mountain bike group, a snowmobile club, um, you know, people involved in municipal government, people involved in, you know, working it with seniors in the community, whatever it is, like what are all those different avenues? Find the person that gets information out and ask them to share and give them the materials that they would need to easily share it. 
the tip of this pyramid, which Jessica mentioned, is that personal invite. Um, it's really like you can compare it to um, fundraising in a way. Like when you send out an appeal letter, you get a certain amount of people, you know, sending you some money. If you send out kind of more targeted outreach um, to, you know, really committed donors, you're going to get a little bit more, you know, participating. If you're making the phone call, taking your donor out to lunch, whatever it is, that's where you're really getting the significant dollars when you're doing fundraising. Same thing for showing up for a meeting. If you can call up your neighbor, work with your um, committee to build a list of people who should get direct phone calls or emails from um, members of the committee saying, your voice is really important here. We'd love for you to take part. Um, some small communities that we've worked with, they'll get a group of volunteers, split up everyone in town and call everybody, um, every household in town to get them to, to show up. So um, you wanna touch every aspect of that, that pyramid. I'll just put a tiny little plug to say this is especially critical in um, designing a kind of equitable and inclusive process. If you really want to involve more kind of marginalized voices in your community, whether it's BIPOC community members, whether it's lower income community members, those broad, you know, asks that we typically kind of rely on, they may not reach those folks and those folks may not feel like this is for them. And so any way that you can reach out through trusted partners, through personal, personal but not tokenized um, outreach strategies, that's really gonna be the most effective. And we can share, we've got a kind of internal strategy that we use to make sure we're um, building inclusive processes that we can share afterwards. And I won't go into all this detail, but this is the, this is the strategy that we tend to follow. We've got this kind of list of all the different ways, and I think we'll probably share this um, PowerPoint afterwards, but all the different ways in your community that you can be thinking about getting the word out. And I just wanted to share this, it looks simple. This is the actual template that we use when we're working to design an outreach process in a community. And we can share this as well, although it's very basic, but basically this is just our reminder to ourselves. What are those little, what are those different buckets of outreach we wanna cover? Letter to all residents. Press, what is, what's the TV people are watching? What's the radio people are listening to? What are the local newspapers you wanna get it in? The phone calls is where we assign people to make calls to people in the community. And then other is all those other, we put flyers in every backpack um, of the kids in school, bookmarks in every book that leaves the library, front porch forum, um, flyers around town, all those different ways. And this is just our kind of template that we use to design that. So I feel like we're probably, we're a little bit short on time, I think, Jessica, but um, I guess what I'll say here, um, a lot of this conversation is about the planning and the inviting um, for the, to getting the public there. I also wanted to mention like actually holding your, your conversation, although if we were to get into all the ins and outs of how to run an effective public meeting, we'd need another hour long webinar. I will say, I just wanna plug and I'll put these links in the chat. The Vermont Community Leadership Network is a network of, of leaders around the state that we provide workshops for every um, month or so. And we have recordings of all those past workshops. There are workshops in there of on the kind of library on managing effective meetings, on um, community engagement and inviting the public. And so that's a resource to you. And in that community leadership, guide that we mentioned, there's whole chapters on kind of how the whole, how to hold the actual meetings themselves. Um, but these are just some general tips on hosting your event. And the most important thing being, you know, when you're inviting the public, when you know what your questions are that you're asking, when you have a clear sense of the outcome and the output that you want to achieve, make sure that you're sticking to that agenda and sticking to that plan. You know, any community conversation, if it, if it is a meeting, and Jessica will talk about some other strategies, but if it is a community meeting, the last thing you, you want is for it to feel kind of off track or unstructured, because then people feel like they haven't participated in something meaningful or useful. And so if you're the ones facilitating, if you're working with a facilitator, just making sure that you're making sure that everyone's voice is welcome in the room, that everybody has time to chime in, you wanna be a strict timekeeper, stick to that agenda that you've set for the meeting. Make sure that everyone's getting to weigh in, but that you're keeping comments brief and to the point. Um, you've all, I'm sure, been a part of a, a public meeting 
where there's maybe one, two, five people that tend to dominate the conversation. And as a facilitator in your community or working with an outside facilitator, there are respectful uh, ways to end kind of circular conversation, repeated comments, rambling, um, and bringing people back to the point of like, I think we've heard your idea, you know, let's make sure that we're hearing from other people in the room as well. Or, you know, here's what we're really focused on the agenda right now. Let's stick to this topic. Like really kind of bringing people back to the topic and ending that kind of repetitive discussion um, and not allowing for kind of interruption and, and side conversation. And the more that you can hold your meetings to that structured, facilitated um, uh, agenda, the more effective and the more, the more effective they'll be and the more people will appreciate um, the value of that conversation. And again, more resources on that that we'll share um, in the last slide here. And then it's the last point to say, always make sure you're thinking and following up. Collect emails, <laughs> um, make sure that you're able to communicate back to the community, share photos, share updates. You know, so great to hear from over 100 community members. We'll be in touch soon with next steps. And here's what that will be. Like, just, you know, making sure that you're making people feel that they were heard and they don't just get kind of lost in the, the rest of the process. And Jessica, some creative strategies. Yes, I am unmuted now. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, we are living in an age where I think a lot of folks have had to adapt and, and come up with some creative ways to engage the public. Um, and I think it's just beneficial to think outside the box, right? We've all been to or hosted public meetings where people step up to the mic and have their two minutes and then it's wrestling the microphone from them to the next person. And that, you know, while that is one way to do public comment, I've seen more and more um, organizations move away from that for public comment or public input. Um, you know, we can think of some good examples that I've seen around town forests recently or public lands, um, you know, a story walk style open house where you kind of break up your um, assessment of the forest um, into panels where people can go around and learn more about what you've what you've discovered and then be able to provide input through a QR code right on their phone, you know, takes them right to the story map, showing the same thing and a way to give public comment through through a survey right there on site. Um, you know, you don't have to think of public comment as just um, happening outside of, you know, the regular things you like to do on your town forest, you know, are you already hosting an educational event? Do you have an expert coming in to do a birding walk or a, um, you know, tree identification walk or forest management walk? You know, that's a time where you can, it can be a listening as well as, um, you know, docent situation where you're giving information, we are also gathering information. It could be as simple as here, we've got a two question survey to fill out at the end here that it will really help us make decisions about these, the future of these type of events or these, these types of management activities. Um, you know, always celebrating is, is important. I think we often forget to do that, especially, you know, if it's something you've got public comment on and then you did something with it, reminding people that this was your idea and look, we're doing it and let's celebrate it. That's a way to, again, show and build trust in the public input process. Um, and then something else that we're starting to see lots more of are affinity group events. And, and Jenna mentioned this earlier is sort of like, how do you build inclusive and effective um, public engagement processes? Sometimes it's offering space for uh, folks who identify, self-identify as part of a, of a certain group to have space that is, um, that's that's for them to be able to speak with one another about the ways that they relate to the town floor. So that looks like uh, parents groups, it looks like senior groups, it looks like pride hikes, uh, it looks like BIPOC uh, events. Um, and again, it could be those educational two-way street events or specifically tailored to um, getting input on a public on a public process. Um, and you know, maybe at the end here, if folks have some cool ideas that they've seen around the state, uh, we'd love to hear about that too. Um, and then, uh, Jenna, if you want to go to the next slide, I think something else that's really important to note with public comment is, um, again, it's a two-way street. You're listening and reflecting back. 
um, what you hear. That is so critical with with public engagement. Um, you know, if it's not captured, it doesn't count, right? Um, it, that's that's really your responsibility to make sure that you have a method to do that. Whether that's capturing survey responses, um, meeting minutes. Um, you know, taking uh, keeping a public record of all survey responses and public record of all comments received at a public meeting. Um, you know, taking pictures, especially if you're doing something creative, like a, you know, we love doing dot exercises for prioritization, or um, you know, the map that you have people provide input on. You know, take pictures of that, not just for um, recording the input you got, but because that's cool to show as part of your, your management plan, right? Or whatever activity you're trying to get input on. Um, a good, a really good practice is, and some, some are required to do this, a summary response to public comments showing that you heard. How did you hear those comments? Um, even if somebody has an idea for like an activity that could never happen on your town forest, it's important to note that you heard it and here's why we're saying no, um, I think something else I learned over my many years of listening to everybody's passionate recreation interests was um, saying no is 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 heard much better when you say why and that we heard you and maybe here's how that could happen. Right, that's sort of the other piece of listening to public comment is showing that you heard people, um, and again showing how that public comment was incorporated into your especially if it's a decision, something that's going to really be binding. How was that public comment incorporated? Um, you know, demonstrating that to the public is really important. And of course, all of this is in the context of, you know, being able to balance public comment with your conditions assessments and the legal constraints or whatever constraints you have on your forest um, is the hard work often of a town forest committee or other responsible party. So I think that we're going to wrap up here. I, I hoping that we'll be able to share these slides afterwards, but I'll put these resources in the chat. So these are all the resources that I had mentioned. Um, the library of those community leadership uh, network workshops. We'll get much more into the ins and outs, which we didn't hear in terms of how to actually, you know, facilitate and manage an effective meeting. Um, and these other resources that I that I mentioned, we'll share that. Um, and then also this list of we mentioned at one point that you know sometimes you may find that you want to bring in outside help and support around facilitation and so wanted to share this kind of bank of potential consultants out there that can do this kind of of work so we'll be sure to share these as well and looking forward to hearing hearing the examples um, of how this plays out in the actual community setting thanks kate yeah excellent thank you guys so much and um i really appreciate that excellent overview um of community engagement, lots of tools and information um, on uh, from, from your expertise and experiences over the years. Um, so yeah, so it, it, our next phase of this webinar, if you will, um, we're gonna be transitioning now to hearing directly from some communities themselves about their experience in uh, stewarding the community engagement process locally. Um, and so, um, so first up, we have uh, Jeanette, uh, <laughs> Uh, Sigali, excuse me, uh, Sigali from um, the town of Huntington. I apologize. Um, I think I swallowed a frog or something on that one. Um, so, uh, so Jen is here joining us and she's going to be sharing a little bit about her experience um, with the Huntington Community Forest. Um, so Jen, if you want to go ahead and start trying to share your screen, um, you can go ahead and start that process. And as you do that, I'm going to go ahead and, and introduce you to everybody. Um, so, Jeanette uh, says any day of the year, you will find her somewhere in the forest, whether it's on a, in trail maintenance, strolling or daydreaming with her dog, mountain biking or cross country skiing or observing birds, or at least attempting to. She's in her happy place when she's in the forest. Jeanette is the co-chair of the Huntington Conservation Committee, excuse me, Hunt Huntington Conservation Commission and a member of the Huntington Community Forest Stewardship Committee. Um, so I'm really excited to have her with us today, um, and I'll go ahead and turn the mic over to her uh, to share Huntington's story of community engagement. Um, and before I do, just a quick reminder again, um, I know there have been a couple of questions that have come into the chat box, but um, but after the community stories get shared, I'd love to kind of open this up into kind of a panel discussion. Um, so please feel free to add questions to the chat box or um, start thinking about what questions you may want to ask our presenters today. 
Jeanette, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thanks. Thanks, Kate. Um, can everyone see my screen? Yay, that worked. <laughs> the hardest part's over. Um, so, so what I'll be sharing is how we acquired our forest. It's in Huntington. We acquired it in March of 2021. And then um, what procedures we took to put together the management plan. It's we'll be sharing about 12 to 14 slides. And I just want to acknowledge that Jenna, um, Aaron Worthley, and Barrett Grimm, who are all on this call, um, played an incredibly important part of all of this, as well as the Huntington community. So we started off with, um, <laughs> we, we made sure we had a conservation fund. That was, that was all good to go. Um, our community, we had a town for, we have a town forest, but you couldn't access it. So we reached out to community members to see what it is they would like in a community forest, if we could purchase one. So um, Jenna and Jessica referred to a dot board. Um, this dot board, uh, sorry, it's not such a great, picture, but it's um, it took place at a forum in 2018. It's um, it was the development of our outdoor and forest based recreation plan. And I think we had over 100 people show up at this forum to tell us what they wanted for a community forest. And on this dot, dot board, I wanted to share this page, especially because initially the first one is recreation. Um, you know, and people would put, well, it's least important or equally important or very mostly important. So you'll, you'll see like all the dots for recreation. It, there was a, a, a strong support for recreation, education and demonstration projects, natural resources and habitat, and then timber and forest products. Our community is like, eh, it's not so important. So that was good to know as we, um, as we began our search for a community forest. So armed with that information, we put together um, an outdoor forest-based recreation plan. And I won't say we did that alone. We did it with the help of Vermont Urban and Community Forests. Thank you so much. And um, we had to have that approved by the select board. And our conversation with the select board was just know once we find a piece of property, we have to move fast. And government doesn't move fast. But um, we had already had a piece of land um, sell right out from under us as we were pursuing actually this same piece of land about 10 years previous. So um, we got that support as well. Also, the Planning Commission um, helped us out by getting the outdoor forest-based recreation plan into our town plan. So we got through the legal details and realized, okay, how are we going to go about finding a piece of property without scaring a landowner? So we were provided actually by Aaron Worthley of Arrowwood Environmental with a property map of our community of all properties, 200 acres or more. And he had color coded it for us and everything. So it's easy to look at. So our conservation commission poured over it and we each chose a landowner that we knew or were associated with. And we wanted to reach out to them just to see if they had any thoughts about maybe selling their property as a community forest. One of the most important things I had learned from a similar panel to this was that we have to get that property before it goes on the market. Um, otherwise, it, it just disappears before you can make the move. So it turned out we actually did have a connection. Um, 
there was a gentleman in town that expressed interest in selling. The most difficult part was we had to keep it quiet. Um, we didn't want to scare him off. So we, um, you know, we, we couldn't like announce it to the town. We wanted to make sure all the ducks were in a row before we then could say, hey, guess what folks, we're working on a community forest. So we were lucky in that we brought Kate Warner in of the Trust for Public Lands and Bob Heiser of Vermont Land Trust. Um, and they just had a conversation with the landowner and um, just explained the whole process to them. And then we brought it before the select board just to let them know this is something we're working on. And, um, and then we could kind of, then we're like, okay, time to let the community know what we're up to. And this was, for all of us, I think, was the really fun part. Um, we let made the community aware and we shared with them a um, property that we were working to purchase. And we used every method available. Um, front porch forum, the, we put a flyer insert in the local paper. There's a coffee social on Sunday, kind of where all the, um, <laughs> I don't, well, I'll lose the, use the term loosely, but you know, kind of the curmudgeons are there with their arms folded and shaking their heads. <laughs> and um, you know, I wanted to make sure we made an indent there as well. I wanted to be sure those guys were in support of this forest. And um, we're lucky enough to have a local Huntington weather blogger who has about 650 followers, John Hatton. And he walked the forest with us. And he's an excellent photographer as well. So he posted photographs on his, um, on his weather blog and talked about the forest there as well. Um, we also provided uh, frequently asked questions, kind of did a printout of them and uh, posted them on our town website. And I, I'm pretty sure we did hard copies as well because we always wanted to be cognizant that not everyone has a computer or internet access. Um, and you know, these questions were things like, how will it affect my taxes? Um, you know, where is it? Like, all, all those things we tried to um, try to anticipate the questions. And those frequently asked questions were continually updated as questions came in. Um, so we're all excited planning walks to get people into the forest and the pandemic hit. And um, it, it kind of was a punch to the gut. It's like, oh no, how are we gonna get people into the forest? So um, this forest already had existing trails, but folks weren't familiar with it. So a few of us went out and flagged trails in different colors, created a map and put it up on the town website and um, let everyone know on Front Porch Forum, we provided a link to the map um, to get to get people out there. I mean, we, we couldn't lead tours, but folks could go out. And, um, you know, some of my favorite things were when I'd hear a parent say, oh yeah, I took Thea out the other day. And, and she was just, she'd be like, mommy, here's another blue ribbon. And she like followed the, followed the trail. So it was like, man, it really worked. So, um, it was great for us too that the landowner allowed the public access to happen. Um, one of the things that the public, that our community had asked for when thinking back to that forum was um, they wanted sledding hill access as well. And um, this, this forest actually supplied that as well. And this was happening near, um, it was like December while the uh, forest was still undergoing um, purchase plans. And uh, it was just so fun to see kids out on a sliding hill because there had been one in town, 
but it could be used only by permission only and you know for an hour or two so um, it's wonderful to have this resource as well um, community members had also asked for river access and um, we were able to work with a bordering landowner who actually donated a piece of his land to the community forest so so man we got everything that people put their dots on so that was that was great and um and and then if jenna and jessica mentioned celebrate um we were lucky enough this was when everyone was vaccinated and feeling like a superpower and we were able to have our celebration in uh, June of 2021, we closed on the property in March of 21. So um, they, I think we had about 100 people there. And one of the things that happened at that um, celebration is we had a, a local volunteer sitting under a tent asking people as they came in to get their cake and prizes. Um, would they like to be part of a volunteer trail committee? And she got a huge number of names. We haven't reached out to them yet, but we're about to put them all to work. So, um, so we got to celebrate, but <laughs> you know that was kind of short-lived. I mean, everyone's having a blast in the forest, but we need to get to work and have a management plan for our forest. So um, first thing we had to do was to do develop a charter to even be recognized, develop a stewardship committee. And we wanted to have it very diverse. So, um, you know, we, we put a note out on Front Porch Forum that we were looking for volunteers. Um, but when we, when we didn't get enough, we certainly tapped into, um, there's a guy on the committee that's from VAP that represents the local VAST chapter. There's the Brewster Pierce School principal. Um, they're a bordering uh, school to the forest. Um, where our chairman is from Arrowwood Environmental, and um, we have an attorney on the on the board on the committee, conservation commission members, and um, a farmer, a large landowner in town, as well as a um, a bordering landowner who was very involved in the existing trails in that uh, forest now, which was really, it's important to hear what he has to say. Um, very protective of the existing trails out there. So we started the, um, the management plan again, using public input, um, providing educational forums and uh, the forums were followed by Q and A. So each forum was led by an expert in their field. Uh, the forums included land use, natural resources, recreation, education, and we were going to end there. But at every forum, hunting and trapping came up. I mean, it just <laughs> we were get it, it was something that just couldn't you know you we we realized we were just going to have to have another form specifically on hunting and trapping so we felt like we had shared a ton of information around um everything that the forest has to offer and we had a natural resource inventory team of students from the rubenstein school of environmental science um, come out and actual, actually conduct an inventory. And then they shared that with the public. So um, folks really got to know, our community really got to know their forest pretty darn well inside and out in so many ways. Um, so after all the forums, um, we had a couple really tech savvy folks within the committee design, uh, design a survey and it was available both online and hard copy. Again, sent out through the local paper. I think it was probably available at 
Beaudry's, our local store, because um, not, again, not everybody has access to being online. So, um, so we, we got the results of the survey back and we, um, we used the survey questions. We thought about everything we had heard from people on the forum as these questions were designed and really tailored them to what was on people's minds. Like there were several questions around hunting and trapping. And we just wanted to be clear, we knew what people were, were folks were looking for. So once the management plan was finally put together, I, I think it took about a year, <laughs> seemed like 10, um, but um, that, that had to be approved by Vermont Land Trust and the Trust for Public Lands and um, the select board, and it was. So as, as soon as, it, it really wasn't as simple as all that sounded, <laughs> but, um, and then as soon as, as soon as the management plan was approved and such a group of volunteers put up some kiosks, um, LL Bean had donated funds to our community to, to assist with our forest. So we wanted to get those informational kiosks up as soon as possible. So we'd look a little more professional than just the flagging on all the trees. And we also include a dog waste station to send a message early on that um, we need to keep our forest clean. And it was also something the, um, one of the teachers at the school had brought up because the school's borders this community forest. And they said, you know, the kids use the forest a lot, which is great, but we don't want them tracking in dog poo into the school. So it was just something that, you know, really rang home with me when we were um, figuring out ways to use the funds. I'm like, we've got to get a dog waste station. And I'm happy to say I was over there yesterday and it is getting used. Um, so, so then from there, it's like, man, just, just enjoy the forest. We're currently working, now working on a trail plan um, for the forest. So um, I'm sure I missed a ton of stuff, but that's our, yeah, thank you so much, Jeanette. That's um, uh, very uh, a lot of things you guys have been working on. Um, so, um, and I know there are a few questions that have come in. So, um, just a reminder to folks that um, we're going to hold questions until um, after our last um, presentation. Um, and so, with that, I'm going to go ahead and um, introduce our final presentation. Um, and hopefully, um, you should see my screen now. I'll be actually running the screen um, for John. So John Skarinza um, will be joining us to share about the Randolph Community Forest. John grew up in Randolph, New Hampshire, um, and he's a retired New Hampshire State Police Trooper Commander, having served uh, over 30 years in law enforcement. Currently, he serves as the chairman of the Randolph and Coos County Planning Boards and the chairman of the Randolph Forest Commission. And most recently, um, uh, I'm excited to share that John is the proud father of an 11th month old son named Ethan, uh, who has been walking for several weeks now, and John shares that he feels like he's already smarter than his dad. Um, so uh, really, uh, congratulations, John, on um, your latest, your new addition, and uh, I'm sure a future steward of the Randolph Community Forest. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, John, and run the slides in the background. Sounds great. Good afternoon. And uh, yes, he not only started walking yesterday, he went up the stairs. So uh, we're in trouble. <laughs> But um, so in listening to all the previous presenters on how to do outreach, um, different mechanisms, uh, I can tell you that uh, when we created our town forest and the Randolph town forest is a almost an 11,000 acre town forest now. It was previously um, commercial timberland, and uh, Randolph is a is a community of 320 plus or minus um, annual residents. Uh, so it's a very small town, um, and we were bordered by this very large commercial timberland, and uh, that had worked fine for 
the first 120 or so years. But as folks probably know, um, in the 70s and the early 80s, timber uh, paper mills, because there's a paper, there was a paper mill in the adjacent town of Berlin, um, they started divesting themselves of their land holdings um, to Timos and uh, other investors. And as that process continued, um, like I say, during the 70s and 80s, where in the past, if we had a question of, hey, you know, what, what's the management philosophy? What are you doing on the forest? Um, you could just stop in at the local forester's office. Um, towards the end, those decisions were, in, in one instance, actually being made overseas. Um, so there certainly was a concern of, hey, what's going to happen to these lands, which we had always had public access on and had always assumed they would always be there. And, and the reality was um, they might not. So that's sort of how we got engaged in, in the effort in the end of, of creating our own town forest, which like I say is um, not quite 11,000 acres right now. And uh, when we did that, um, the, you know, <clears throat> the, I'll, I'll try to fill in a couple of things. Um, that weren't covered earlier, um, we we started off sort of with, and we called it a gang of three, of which I was one of the gang of three, um, to look into how to best protect this land. And, and what was very successful, I don't think we initially planned it this way, but this is how it worked out, um, was we had, what as I say, one of the gang of three, was on the right, one of the gang of three was on the left. And thankfully we had a retired gentleman who was very much in the middle politically um, of those two. And um, naturally my phone's ringing. And uh, where that was helpful was, yes, I'm a state police retired troop commander. Um, and when I retired, I was responsible for 40% of the state and uh but in my patrol days i knew the local truckers i knew the local loggers i knew a lot of the the local business people um in the area and they knew me you hopefully for the better but sometimes not um but where it became helpful was when we were talking about this project and yes very much um, use the local press. Um, we would write public service announcements and, uh, you know, ask the papers to publish them. That was one way that we really informed um, our local population of what was going on. Um, but then you might hear as a result of that, um, well, they're going to buy the forest and the only thing that they're concerned about is, is not cutting timber. They're going to lock it up. Um, for the wildlife and, and folks to recreate on, but um, we're gonna lose that, uh, <clears throat> that opportunity to harvest timber. And yes, we, we do cut wood. Um, and, and what's important, and I think it's similar in, in Northern Vermont, is keeping your wood basket intact. Um, if it gets too broken up and too scattered, it's, it's really difficult for a logging industry to continue. And in Coas County, which is in Northern New Hampshire, um, that is, was, and, and hopefully one day will continue to be um, an important part of our local economy. Um, but you need large tracts of adjacent woodland to do that. So when those comments would come in, hey, you know, they're just gonna buy it and post it to, to uh, no timber harvesting, my job was to go out um, and talk to those folks and, and assure the local loggers and assure the, the local business folks that no, in fact, the vision was that this was going to be a working forest um, and would continue to provide local jobs for the local economy um, and wood fiber um, you know, for the local mills. Uh, our, our gentleman on the left um, was a vice president of the Appalachian Mountain Club, who happened to 
um, live in town and we, we all live within, you know, two minutes walk of each other. And uh, so when you had a conservation minded group that maybe said, oh my God, you know, they're gonna buy this land and they're gonna clear cut it, then it was his job to go out and speak with those folks and, and assure them that, no, we're gonna manage this land sustainably um, while allowing traditional recreational uses. Um, and uh, so that was effective um, because we were able to, to, to cover both of those constituent groups. And then the gentleman in the middle, his, he, he was a retired, um, he had worked for the Ford Foundation, um, was very good at writing letters because part of our process was um, also in lobbying. And I think in, in any big project, lobbying your, your local, your state and your federal um, political leaders uh, as to why they should help you get money um, to, to designate towards, towards a project like this. And in fact, we were successful at that. Um, we, one of our, we used the Forest Legacy Program um, and actually got an earmark. And yes, earmarks can be a bad word until it's an earmark for your project. And then it's maybe not so bad. But um, so that was the gang of three. And uh, we worked sort of independently um, from the town government, um, although most of us were on local boards also. I was chairman of the planning board. Um, Walter um, was on the conservation commission. David was also on the, on the planning board. So as we made progress um, going forward, we would then hold um, meetings periodically in town and really in, inform folks as, as to what was, was going on, answer any questions um, that, that may come along. And um, so uh, the, our town forest is now 20 years old. Um, it's an active, it's, it's the largest town forest east of the Mississippi and, and it's been a tremendous success. And so for current management um, philosophies is, Yes, we, we certainly have an extensive stewardship plan. Um, and as part of that process, we hold scoping sessions to, to learn from folks in town, you know, what are priorities um, that, that you would like to see. And uh, based on the information, and yes, we've all seen the dot boards based on the dots, um, we make those priorities as a part of our stewardship plan. What has been also been very successful is uh, the first Saturday of every August, we hold with a forest tour. And um, the photo that's, that's on the board now is uh, one of those days. And in this instance, uh, we were talking about wetlands and um, you know, the water resources on the community forest. But we also, and, and early on especially, um, when we did a timber harvest, that's where our forest tour would go. And, and we would take people and we'd stand in the middle of a timber harvest and our forester would then um, explain, you know, why a certain management philosophy had been adopted um, and, and how that helped to manage for wildlife, for birds. Because yes, um, we actually do some not large clear cuts, but sometimes, you know, eight to 10 acre clear cuts. And uh, so we walk right into the middle of the clear cut and, and explain to folks, um, you know, why, why that was the prescription. And when you can explain that, hey, you know, the certain bird species of the mature forest need open spaces so they can, they can forage for insects and stuff. And uh, you know, studies have shown that you know that space needs to be at least three or four acres clear um, to be effective. Uh, all of a sudden, that clear cut, um, which when you look at it and say, "Oh, they cut all the trees," now looks looks a whole lot different. Um, we've also, over the last twenty years, and and there's a picture of dirt to trees to wildlife. So this year's that year's theme was how people could improve their backyard for wildlife habitat. And uh, we taught them how to, you know, read soils, maps, 
um, download your aerial photography, um, and really get the information that's available out there on the web um, for anybody and how you can incorporate that into uh, managing on, on your own land. And uh, <clears throat> this is a photograph from another year where we were talking about invasive species. Um, that's a rail trail there. And unfortunately what happens is um, vehicles will pick up the seeds of purple loose strife and move them along. Uh, so uh, we, were, we were talking about how to, how to try to eradicate um, some of that. Other ways uh, that we've engaged the public and, and, and really gets folks to, to know what's going on is uh, we host a, a, an annual foot race, which is 10 kilometers, and that's on the, on the town forest. Um, when we build trails, uh, as you saw, you, you, you put up kiosks, you put up informational bulletins. Um, we have an interpretive trail that has uh, nine different stations on it. It's geared so that, um, you know, it's, it's not handicapped accessible, but it's very accessible. And uh, especially for, for little kids and stuff. Um, Randolph is fortunate. We have a publication called the Mountain View, which comes out four times a year. So we generally have an article in that each each season, which uh, where we describe what's going on or if we're adding a parcel. For instance, we just received a donation of 240 acres, um, which has a paleo Indian um, excavation site on it. And uh, it's actually one of the better sites um, in New Hampshire. And it's 12,000 years old. And uh, there's, a, there's extensive um, record of, of activity um, from when folks were, uh, your Native, Native Americans were hunting caribou and traveling through the river corridors, um, getting from Vermont over uh, to Maine. And another important thing, and I think you know, most towns could do, and, and I work hard to, to put in a good report in our town report, because that's sort of the historical document. And so that'll generally be three pages. We'll talk about the past year's timber harvests. We'll talk about um, any wildlife projects um, that are going on and really get the word out. People can read it. If they have questions, they can call. We meet monthly, the Forest Commission meets monthly. So anybody can come to a forest commission meeting. Um, so yeah, it's been a great success. And uh, like I say, if there maybe would be questions that would be better for me to answer than to just keep chattering, I can talk for hours. Thank you so much, John. And uh, thank you so much for sharing the story of the Randolph uh, Community Forest. Um, so much there and, um, and I, I'm excited to have you join us. Um, I would like to transition. I know we have a few more minutes left. You know, whenever we're planning these uh, these these types of webinars, you never know exactly how things are going to come together. Um, and so um, we do have a few more minutes left, and I really would like to transition us to kind of a community uh, panel um, and panel discussion. Um, we did have a, a, a participant with a question, um, Maria. I am not sure if you're still there or not, um, but um, you. Yes, uh, I am. You are still here. Yeah. So I'll let you go ahead and kick off our panel discussion um, with your question. Thank you. Uh, I'm in Wilkett and we're just starting the, the planning process. We're working with Kate Wenner and from the uh, Trust for Public Land. Uh, we don't own the parcel yet. It'll probably be about 450 acres. There's also the possibility that another 300 acre parcel or so would be glommed onto that. My question, and we probably will do timbering. We did some um, initial uh, surveying about a year and a half ago, but now we're getting into the real, you know, kind of uh, more dedicated stuff. Um, my general question is uh, how, to what degree do you use this process to try to uh, define an ethic that might be a little ahead of the curb, curve. Um, I know that some of these plans uh, that I have read, I think I've read the one from Huntington and Barry and a few others, you know, they talk about uh, 
the, the forest being an area where wildlife can migrate, for example, in response to climate challenges. And that's really the only time it's mentioned, uh, climate change is mentioned. Now for us, the vast will run through town anyway. So I don't, it's not so much a question of having it in the forest, but I wonder why we're encouraging, several people mentioned snowmobiles, why are we encouraging petroleum-based recreation when we're in a climate crisis? I also, um, you know, so at, at, to what degree do you, do you ask people, and you know, in our initial survey, we, we didn't get people who said, yeah, we have to have snowmobiling there, we have to have this, we have, so I think, a lot of those people probably feel that the vast will take care of it, but you know, at what point are we going to face reality and um, and <laughs> suggest that, for example, if you have an electric snowmobile or if you know, to try to to try to um, have the forest represent the real situation instead of people just being able to do what you know whatever they want. Thanks, Maria, for that question. And and, um, and if I might, you know, I might kind of broaden it, um, you know, especially as we talk about- Could I just add something onto there? I'm sorry. I also wanted, um, John, you mentioned that you found this, this paleo Indian site, which sounds fabulous. One of the things I want to do with our plan is to bring in Abenaki participation. And I've made some initial contacts about that, you know, so that they can gather there, uh, maybe do ceremony, I don't know. Um, you know, that we, that they uh, help us in naming trails or something like that too. So, you know, I'm sure some people would be afraid of that and think, oh, we're just giving all the land back or something. So we'd have to be very specific about it in the beginning, that that's not what we're doing, but I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Maria, for, for adding that, because I think, you know, sort of um, to frame the question maybe a little bit broader, um, you know, I'd love to hear from, um, from our panelists, you know, sort of what strategies they've used um, to, to engage, you know, sort of the um, broader uh, suite of community voices, um, you know, and, and, and thinking of, and sort of especially in engaging in some of these community issues, which can be really thorny um, and, yeah. um, you know, sort of can run the spectrum of public values. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, um, we've heard a lot of different ideas today, but I, I'm curious from folks, you know, any um, on the panel, any ahas or sort of lessons learned um, that you can share with our participants today in terms of uh, engaging kind of that broader spectrum of folks across the community and also uh, ra you know, sort of addressing some of these more complex, thorny uh, public issues on our public town forest. Um, yeah. Actually, I, I, I know I had mentioned fast when we were talking about the Huntington Community Forest. There, when we purchased the property, there was an existing vast trail there. And, um, you know, the last thing I would want to do with a community forest is say, no, you're not welcome. Um, I, I think eventually climate change will determine how much the forest gets used for vast. There is just one trail that that shoots through. Um, and, you know, we weren't about to deter that. But um, as far as aha moments, I'm just gonna say it's when an 80 something year old woman spoke up at our forum and said, what about me? How, how are you, gonna, how's this forest, how are you gonna make this forest work for me? Cause she's paying her taxes towards it. And that was my aha moment. It's like right now the access, you have to go up a, a hill. So she need, we need to find an easier access into our forest for people of all ages and abilities. I was answering two questions at once. <laughs> what did you wind up doing about the trapping? Because no one yet has said anything about uh, you know, wanting trapping. We probably will have some hunting in some areas because people traditionally have hunted there. And, um, but uh, I mean, for trapping, you know, my opinion is that you shouldn't, in a community forest, you shouldn't be engaging in activities where some of the participants have to chew their legs off to get away. 
That's just, yeah. but that's just my kind of baseline. Um, I mean, what's the purpose? Why? There is no trapping and we, we decided not to have the trapping. And did you have any, any resistance to that? Maybe a couple of folks mentioned their concerns. I mean, well, I think we worded it so that trapping would be allowed if it was absolutely, no, I can't remember the exact verbiage. I think I've seen that phrasing though, you know, if you yeah. needed it to remedy a situation or something. Something yeah. like that, correct. But otherwise no trapping. Yeah, Maria, I can put a link in the, uh, I think I, I already did put a link in the chat box to uh, the Huntington Community Forest website um, that has more information and a whole list of all their policies. Um, I, I appreciate all these questions and I, I really hate to cut you off, but I also just want to recognize we are at 1.30 and I would just love uh, to hear from the other panelists, um, any ahas or um, kind of lessons learned uh, in terms of helping, um, you know, communities and town forests navigate some of these public uh, issues that you, that you're bringing up. So, uh, I want to open it up to the other panelists to respond. Um, well, I can I can jump in, Kate, and I appreciate uh, the conversation. It's you know I, my job previously was really trying to think about all the different ways that human beings wanted to engage with their public lands uh, recreationally, which, as you can imagine, that means that you have lots of strong opinions because people really like to do those things, right? And so the most important thing to do is to try to be that neutral convener, convener. And I think Jenna did a good job of sort of framing that up. Um, you know, your job, if you're a, a, on a town forest committee is not to manage by opinion. Unfortunately, we can have our opinions as, as individuals, but we really need to be able to hold space for conversations that <clears throat> balance good sound science with public interest and be able to facilitate a conversation around the balance of those of those things. And I think John did a really good job of speaking to the ways that they're trying to balance all of those interests. Um, I put in the chat, I, climate change is, is a hard one. I would say my other role with um, with VCRD is working on our climate economy programs. And you know we've really shifted over the years in terms of how we speak about climate change in rural communities in Vermont, but we do speak about it because it is something that is here and coming and, and is going to affect households in, in small towns in Vermont. Um, and so again, the way we do that is not um, in any kind of a combative or confrontational manner. We, we center it in things that community members can control. And their town forest is a thing that they have uh, some measure of control over, right? So what a perfect place to think about, how can we think about the future of our town um, mitigating or adapting to uh, the climate impacts we're seeing as through our town forest and the future of that town forest. And, you know, again, I, sometimes when you know there are lots of controversial issues that are going to come up in your public engagement process, that's a time where you might think about inviting an outside neutral facilitator to, to assist in those scenarios. Um, or you just pick the, the right person on your team who can really hold that space. Um, and I see Jenna unmuting and I'm curious her thoughts too. Yeah, no, I, I would have said everything you just said, Jess, but just to add like in general, um, one thing you, you, you might consider Maria and, and anyone kind of thinking about this process is, you know, you can, sometimes it can be helpful. You're, you're gonna get into the nitty gritty questions of the community, but it might be helpful to take a step back at some point in your process and kind of create like a owned, like a collective vision um, you know, kind of conversation where you could ask, like, you know, what are the values that we hold as we think about the future of our town forest? That could just be one way to bring in some of those bigger picture issues to help frame the work going forward. Um, but I'll just say more specifically, like, where there, like Jessica's kind of referring to, I think where there are tricky, challenging, controversial issues, like, don't shy away from them. Like, it's okay to ask those questions of the community and put it out there. I think the, um, you know, the in Huntington, uh, the committee did such a good job, like framing that series of, of forum conversations on issues that they knew would come up as important issues and providing information, you know, sharing that information, but then being able to step back and be that neutral convener that Jessica is describing and, and ask the tough questions. You know, they, um, in Huntington, they held a, a forum on hunting and trapping. And um, 
if you, you know, if you manage that, that meeting well and don't let it dissolve into an, an argument, it can be really powerful and meaningful and actually healthy for the community to dive into those tough issues. So, and so, yes, all, I agree with, with, with all of that. The devil's always in the details and it's listening to your different constituencies, um, which sometimes are not always gonna agree. We, we allow snowmobiling. We had probably 15 miles of existing snowmobile trails, which were on that commercial timberland. And so, so yes, in part of getting buy-in, from those folks, um, you certainly couldn't uh, say, hey, we're not going to allow snowmobiles. We, we don't allow um, ATVs. And, and the good reason for that is because of the tremendous impact um, they have on your trails, unless you really build hardened trails. So, so eight, ATVs, um, we don't allow. An interesting um, thing that's come up in the, in the in the circle of, of climate change recently on large tracts of land is carbon credits. And uh, so, so you'll have, we've had this discussion and we're in the process of this discussion of, well, we should sell carbon credits um, and, and that'll help global warming. Like I say, the devil's always in the details because then you'll, you might hear that same person say, how they're headed to California and flying on a jet, and uh, we've burned. Then, then you've burned up all the all the carbon credits we just just saved. So, um, you know, some of it's going to be uh, a balance for, for sure. Great, thank you so much, John. And um, and I just uh, I, I want to recognize we are at time, um, and so. Um, I do, this is such a rich conversation and I hate to cut it off, um, but I do want to recognize um, we, we are at 1.30. So, um, so thank you. Um, so we'll have to keep the conversation going, right? You know, um, you know this is really the first um, of our kind of attempt to hold, um, you know, sort of a webinar in this type of um, community panel format. Um, and, um, and so I look forward to, um, to doing more of these. And, 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 um, and in fact, actually, we do have a whole series lined up. So, um, I'll share more about that in just a second, but I wanted to thank all of our presenters today and everybody who took the time to join us. Um, thank you for sharing your expertise and your experience. Um, and then, um, like I said, you know, we this is the first of a um, ongoing webinar series. Um, and so we have four more webinars lined up um, for June. Um, and the next one uh, Jessica had mentioned in her remarks um, is actually on engaging our communities virtually, um, drawing on some of the experience and expertise of SE Group, who's a planning consultant team, uh, both here in Vermont, as well as across the, the country um, in community engagement in a time of COVID. Um, and so they'll be sharing some of their experience um, with uh, getting folks both in the online environment, um, providing public input, um, as well as some pretty cool creative tools that they've been using actually out in the forest. So, um, so that's our next webinar and that's on June 2nd. Um, and then you can see here the list of, um, of other webinars that we have lined up. So, um, so with that, I wanna thank everybody, thank our panelists. Thank you, um, Jessica and Jenna from, uh, from BCRD, Vermont, Community, Vermont Council on Rural Development, excuse me, um, and Jeanette and John um, for joining us, taking the time to share their stories and their expertise. Um, and, um, and thank everybody for, uh, for taking the time to participate today. Um, so, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and close out the webinar. If folks are still around um, and um, you know, have uh, any questions, I'll hang out for a little bit. Um, and any of the panelists um, who are able you know, are welcome to stay around. But, um, but thank you again, everybody. Um, it's been, been, a fun, been a fun webinar. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Kate.